You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned a burglary detail. In a year's time, a burglar has taken approximately $80,000 in money and jewelry. None of his victims can describe him. Your job? Get him. Dragnet. The documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Tuesday, July 10th. It was hot in Los Angeles. We were working a day watch out of burglary detail. My partner is Frank Smith. The boss is Captain Wisdom. My name's Friday. It was 8.02 a.m. when I got to room 45. Burglary. That you, Joe? Yeah. How about that fight last night? Huh? Did you see it on Channel 4? No, I started to watch it. The set went out. Picture cube? I don't know, Joe. Picture got all fuzzy and started a while. But you know, like when an airplane goes over between the set and the train. Oh, yeah, I know. The set's been acting up lately. I thought it might be something wrong with the aerial, so I figured I'd take a look at it. Mm-hmm. Got the ladder out, got up on the roof. Sure enough, one of the wires on the thing was off. Just hanging by a little bit of the rubber coating. Mm-hmm. Climbed back down to get the wire cutters to fix it. Couldn't find them. Had to use scissors to strip the insulation off the wire. Got the wire all fixed to put back on, then I couldn't find the pliers to get the nut off the aerial. Looked all through the house, no soap. Well, what'd you do? Nothing I could do. Try to get the nut off with the scissors. Broke them. Finally went back into the house to listen to the radio. The fight was over. Yeah, it only went four rounds. Yeah, I found that out. Got the radio on just when the announcer was given the last commercial. And Faye and me had a talk. Well, not again. Yeah, I told her I was going to buy a whole new set of tools. The first time I saw the kids with one of them, I was going to raise the roof. Yeah, must have made it happen. Yeah, it did. Made some remark about them only being kids. Said if I wanted to keep the tools out of their hands, I should put them in a place where they can't reach them. There's only one trouble, Joe. Well, what's that? With Mike and Stacy, there isn't such a place. Yeah, I figure I know what you mean. It's sure a good fight, though. It's too bad you missed it. Yeah. Right in, Smith? Yeah, Skipper. Right here, will you? Thanks. Skipper, what's up? Sit down. Just got a call from the Wilshire Division. That string of burglaries they've had out there, mm-hmm. they can't spare the men to give this thing the time it looks like it's going to take to turn it off. So I'm putting you two on it. And here's all the crime reports, huh? Uh, looks like they've been busy. A lot of reports here. Well, what's he pick on? Money and jewelry. Mm-hmm. He used a celluloid strip to get into the houses. Not much unusual about that. No. According to the reports, he's been hitting around 3.30 to 6 in the afternoon. Yeah, he evidently rings the bell first to see if there's anybody in the house. And then if there isn't, he uses a celluloid to open the door. Goes through the house and then leaves by the back door. What's this bit here about the glass of milk? Well, that's the one part of his M.O. that's new. It seems every place he goes into, he has a glass of milk before he leaves. Any prints on the glass? I haven't found any yet. Seems to wipe the glass clean before he leaves. Did that's office come up with anything on the M.O.? Nothing that hasn't been checked out. The leads they gave us didn't go any place. Mm. How about the victims? Any of them ever see the guy? No, not good. A couple of them have caught glimpses of him leaving the house. Didn't realize at the time that he'd just come from their place. How about a description? Everybody that's seen him tells a different story. Some have him tall and thin, others have him short and husky. Some have him dark, others like anybody's guess. Oh, that makes it easy, huh? You been working any one area, Skipper? Yeah, according to those reports, he works around in here. And here, from Wilshire to Pico in the south, La Brea to Robertson in the west. A lot of areas, Skipper. Yeah. How about help? Much as you need. Metro will give you as many men as they can spare. Said you could probably count on ten teams. Well, we should be able to patrol the area pretty well with them. Be it more than one place a day? Yeah. Sometimes three or four. Depends on how much time it takes them to go through a place. Well, it never works later than six o'clock. No, not that we know. It's pretty smart. More people on the streets that time of day, less likely to be noticed. Yeah. That's probably the way he figures it. I still don't think I get this milk from you. Yeah, it's a weird one. You have it every place he goes? Seems to. The owner comes home and finds all the money and jewelry in the place gone and an empty glass on the table in the living room. Living room? Yeah, in the living room. Evidently pours the milk right after he gets into the house and carries it around with him while he works. Finishes it up before he leaves. Boys from Wilshire have found those rings, you know, when you put a glass down on the table. Yeah, I know. Found them all over the house. They haven't found any prints at all, huh? No, Leighton Prince has gone over the places completely. Everything they found has a right to be there. Belong to the family or friends. $80,000. How about the pawn shop detail? They turn up anything? No, nothing. None of the jewelry has turned up as far as we can tell. It looks like a gem, huh? It is. It's all yours. All right, we'll get started on it right away. You two stay on this until you clean it up. Right, Skipper. Any ideas where you're going to start? Well, only one place, the neighborhood where he works. Yeah? We don't know him. Maybe he'll come to us. Frank and I went over the reports. In general, the operation was the usual type. Use of a celluloid strip to enter a house wasn't new. The suspect operated during those times when detection was least likely. He never operated in the rain. 
All in all, with the exception of the milk drinking, the case could have been a hundred others. Frank and I spent the rest of the afternoon talking to the victims who had seen the burglar. We were all sure that the man they'd seen was the one we wanted, but their description varied from each other. All the victims had been shown mug books, but failed to identify the suspect. We called Metro Division and asked them to give us as many radio units as possible to cover the area. They assigned ten cars to the detail. Frank and I covered the entire area in our car. Wednesday, September 5th, two months had passed, during which time the burglar hit only two houses. In spite of the heavy patrol action in the area, he got away safely in both instances. 5.45 p.m. Looks like another day shot, huh? Yeah, another 15 minutes to go. Well, one thing, anyway, he's calmed down, Joe. He's going to make 100000 this year. Wait a minute, right? Yeah? Up ahead there on the left, White House? Yeah, I can see him. Uh, pull over here, we'll walk down. Huh? Right. Come on, you can get on my side. All right. Still working. Yeah, probably a double lock on that door, huh? Said it won't work there. Having a little trouble, mister? Huh? Looks like you're having a little trouble getting that door open. Oh, yeah, I lost the key. You police officers? Yeah, that's right. Oh, well, happy to know you're on the job, protecting my house and all. Sure appreciate it. What if we can see your identification? I beg your pardon? Your identification? What if we can see it? Well, what's the matter? Don't you believe me that I live in this house? We just like to see your ID. Nothing wrong with you showing it to us, is there? Oh, of course not. He looks like I left my wallet in the house. What's that gadget you were trying to get into the house with there? Oh, this? Mm-hmm. A piece of cellulite. I read about it someplace. I happen to have it. Mm-hmm. Turn around, will you, toward the street? Yeah, sure. What do you want? What's the address of the house you live in? The address? Yes, sir. You guys still don't believe I live here, do you? The address, what is it? Uh, 1200 block in Allendale. What's your name? Anderson. Jack Anderson. Maybe you can explain why the name of the mailbox is Radcliffe, huh? Well, yeah. Sure, I can explain. You see, I'm just visiting here. Summer vacation. Just out here a couple of weeks. All right, Mr. Standstill. Hey, wait a minute. What's going on? You got no right to Standstill. Still. How about this wallet? Is it yours? Yeah. Oh. Uh, come on, give it back. No, no, let's take a look here. You said your name was Anderson, is that right? Well, yeah, but I can explain that. Yeah, I hope so. It's going to be a little involved, though. Oh, what's wrong? Two things. Wrong house and wrong identification. <laughs> Frank and I took the suspect back to the city hall for interrogation. Although he gave us the name Jack Anderson, all his identification bore the name Robert Red Neal. We ran the name through r and Neal had several previous arrests on burglary charges. According to the record, there were no wants on him at the time. 6.20 p.m., Frank and I questioned Neal. All right, Neal, come on off it. Okay, so you know I don't live in the house. It looks like one I do live in. I just made a mistake, that's all. They build all these houses out here so they look alike. Well, look, Neil, don't ask us to believe that one. Now, I'm not asking you to believe anything but the truth, and I'm telling you that. Sure, now, what about your record? Well, what about it? A lot of burglary charges. All right, I did a little time. Now, what's that proof? I'm going straight now. You still can't come up with a story to tell why you were trying to get into that house. I told you I thought it belonged to a friend of mine. What's his name? I don't remember. You like milk, Neil? Huh? You like milk? Look, I don't get this. What are you trying to Just prove? Just answer the question. Do you like milk? I can take it or leave it alone. I'm a big boy now. Sometimes I drink coffee. How long have you been in town, Neil? A couple of weeks. Why? Where were you before you got here? Up north. Where up north? Down Sacramento. What'd you do up there? A few odd jobs. Look, if you guys are going to book me, then do it. Let's get this yak over A couple of things we want to settle first, Neil. What? How long were you up north? Um, uh, I guess it's been about six, seven months. Seven months. You got any way of proving that? Look, why should I have to prove anything? You guys figure you got a rap you can stick me with? Okay, try it. Book me in. Look, don't press me. Can you prove you're up north for the last seven months? Yeah, it shouldn't be any trouble at all. Who do we talk to? The sheriff up there. He had me in the can. After waiting for two months, the one suspect we were able to turn had an alibi that we couldn't shake. Frank and I went back to rolling stakeout. The burglaries continued. Evidently, the burglar was getting more and more reckless. The police cars in the area were acting as less of a deterrent to his activities. In two weeks, he looted 16 homes. A week of bad weather brought his operation to a standstill, but as soon as the rain cleared, he went back to work. Tuesday, October 9th, we got a call from an elderly woman who said that she had information regarding the burglaries. Frank and I drove over to talk to her. Won't you sit down, officer? Thank you, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Well, Ms. Blair, you said on the phone that you had something to tell us about the burglary. Yes, I have. Would you like a little something to eat? Sandwich, coffee? I just took some cookies out of the oven. Maybe you'd like some of those in a glass of milk. No, ma'am. Thanks just the same. Now, you just tell us what you know, please. Well, I feel a little silly about it, officer. 
At first, I didn't think I'd say anything about it, but then I got to thinking. I figured it might be better if I did tell you. Yes, ma'am. It's about the burglaries, you know. Yes, ma'am. That's what you said on the phone. Phone? Oh, oh yes. Uh, you mean when I called you? Yes, Miss Black. Now, if you please tell us what it is that you have here. Of course. I guess I'm just being a coward about it, not telling you right out, but when you hear the whole story, you'll understand. Yes, ma'am. You see, I went out to the store yesterday afternoon and had a sale on frozen foods down at the supermarket. Wonderful bargains. Fruit juice at 12 cents a can. Prices on vegetables where you just wouldn't believe it. We understand that, ma'am. Now, how about the burglaries? Oh, yes. Well, I went to the market about 2.30. That's when I left the house. Normally, I meet my husband after work. He brings me home. Only yesterday, he didn't. Uh Uh-huh. He had some work to do at his office. He's in real estate. Yes, ma'am. Well, yesterday he didn't bring me home. I caught a ride with that nice Mrs. Coddington. There's two doors down. She brought me home yesterday. I got here about 3.45. Remember looking at the mantel clock when it came in? Uh, that's from there. Yes, ma'am. Clock has always kept perfect time. Wedding presents. Lovely thing. Yes, ma'am. It's very nice. Isn't it, though? The gold work on the face. Oh, man, we don't like to be rude, but if you just tell us what you know about the burglaries. Well, certainly. You see, I came into the house, and there he was. Yeah. The burglar. There he was in the hall, drinking a glass of milk. Such a nice-looking boy. Just stood there for a minute, drinking the milk. Well, what did he do when he saw you? He put the milk down on the telephone table, and then he started to run to the back door. I told him to stop. Did he? Not at first. Then I told him that my husband was out in back, out in the garage. He stopped then. Go on, man. I asked him what he was doing in my house. What did he say? Well, nothing, really. He just stammered around, said that maybe he'd made a mistake. I told him that I guess he had, breaking into somebody's house. Just terrible, officer. I just scared the wits out of me. Yes, ma'am. I started to tell him how he should be ashamed of himself for stealing from other people. I really told him. I said, you know, we haven't got that much that we can have people like you come in here and steal. Then I picked up the phone and started to call the police. That's when he started to cry. He started to cry? Yes. Just like a little boy. Put his hands up to his face and the tears just streamed down his cheeks. What happened then, Mrs. Black? Well, when I saw him cry, he looked so small like such a little boy that I went over to him and comforted him. You wouldn't get in touch with the police, ma'am? Well, no. Oh, I suppose I should have, but I didn't. When I got the boy calmed down, he told me that he didn't know what he'd do if his family found out about it. He told me about his mother and how she died when he was just a baby and how his sister raised him. He said she was just a couple of years older than him. I asked about his father, and he said that his father was a drunk, that he had to bring in what money the family needed. He said that his sister was sick, bad heart, and that the shock of his being arrested to kill her. Well, now, I asked the officers, what could I do? Well, what did you do, Miss Boy? I told him to sit down. I wanted to talk to him. We went out in the kitchen, and I asked him if he was hungry. You know, growing boy and all. I thought he might like a sandwich or something. Mm-hmm. He said that he didn't want any to eat, but he said he would like a glass of milk, so I poured him one. He said that you'd talk with him? Yes, I thought that maybe I could talk him out of continuing this way, stealing. I asked him if he had a job, something to earn an honest living. Yes, ma'am. He told me that he'd tried to find work after school, but anything he'd get just didn't pay him enough. He tried to get along on the money, but it just wasn't enough. Medicine for his sister and all. Then there was his father, horrible man. But what did he say about his father? Oh, he told me all about him, how he drinks and causes trouble, spends what little money they have on liquor. Uh-huh. Did this boy tell you his name, ma'am? Oh, not at first. He said he didn't want me to turn him in. I told him that I wouldn't, and then he said he was Bob, Bob Allison. Did he tell you where he lived? Not exactly. He said someplace out on East Los Angeles. I got the idea that he wasn't too proud of his home. Can't say that blame him. Uh-huh. How about a description, ma'am, what he looked like? Well, now let me think. Well, I'd say he was young, about 17, maybe 18. Such a young man to be doing something like this. How tall would you say he was, ma'am? Tall? Mm-hmm. Oh, I guess as tall as you are. Maybe just a teeny bit taller. That'd make him about six feet? Yes, I guess so. How about his build, ma'am? Oh, nice, broad shoulders. You got no idea how I felt when I thought about this boy being a thief. It's terrible. Right, well, ma'am. Well. Well, would you say he was heavy or slight? Uh, about how much would you say he weighed? No, well, I'm not... I'm, I'm bad at guessing people's weight. It'd be difficult to say. Well, ma'am, would you say he was as heavy as I am? Yes, about your weight. Uh, how about the color of his hair? Light, nice blonde hair. He had a little wave right here in front, blue eyes. Looked like such a little boy when he cried. Yes, ma'am. Now, was there anything unusual about him that you might have noticed? Scars, moles, anything like that? No, not a thing. Well, how about the way he talked? Anything unusual there, maybe? Mm-mm. Sorry. How about his clothes, Mrs. Blair? How was he dressed? A pair of slacks, a white shirt, no tie. A button was missing from his shirt. Poor boy, probably hasn't got anyone to take care of his clothes. 
had on a school sweater. You know the kind of the seniors get when they're going to graduate? Has the initial of the school on it and no stripes on the sleeve. Yes, ma'am. What was the initial on the sweater? Well, there wasn't one. It had been taken off. I could tell that there had been one, though, because a few of the threads were still in the wall. How about the color of the sweater? Brown. A dark brown to yellow stripe. You know, Miss Blair. Yes? The glass of milk that the boy drank from the glass, has it been washed yet? I thought you'd ask about that. No, I stepped aside for you. You have it now, ma'am? Yes, it's in the kitchen. My husband said you'd want it. He was hopping mad when he heard about it, just about raised the roof right off the house. I wonder if we could see that glass. Please. Of course, it's right out here in the kitchen. Fine. There it is on the drain board. Anybody touched it since the boy? No, I don't think so. My husband might have, but I don't think he did. He was quite adamant about me not washing it until you came. Well, Miss Blair, this happened last night. How was it you waited until this morning to report it? Well, at first I believed the boy. Really thought that it was just circumstances that made him steal. I felt so sorry for him when he broke down and cried. Right here. Leave him. Give him every chance. At that time, I let him go. I thought that it might make you some good, sort of a new beginning. And I told my husband about it. Like I said, he was pretty sore. Talked about the young thief. We never had any children of our own, and I felt so sorry for the boy. I guess my husband couldn't understand. When Bob, that's his name, uh-huh. when Bob said he was sorry, I believed him and let him go. Just let him walk right out of the house. My husband got home, and I told him. He said to call you. I tried to talk to Sam. That's my husband. Yes, ma'am. Uh, make him understand, but he insisted. And then this morning, of course, I agreed with him, and so I called you. Well, why was that, ma'am? Bob stole my watch. There was no record on anyone answering his description. We got out a local broadcast and an APB on him. Mrs. Blair went over the mug books but was unable to identify the boy. Frank got in touch with the Board of Education and asked for the name of the school using the colors brown and gold. They told him that it would take a little time to check but that they'd call us back. We notified the cars from Metro of the new developments and gave them the description of the boy. A check of the phone books for the name netted us nothing. Leighton Prince was sent out to the home of Enid Blair to get the fingerprints of she and her husband. In checking over the empty glass found in the Blair home, besides the prints of Mr. and Mrs. Blair, Dean Bergman came up with a partial unidentified print. It was not enough for classification, but he told us that if we turned the burglar, he could tell us if we had the right man or not. 4.30 p.m. Frank and I cruised the area the burglar had been working in. We were in constant contact with the other ten cars in the field. So you're still working this neighborhood, Joe? Well, we got no choice till we hear otherwise. Funny about the Blair woman, isn't it? What? You know, turning the kid loose. Sure must have put on a show. Yeah, yeah, sure. What time you got? 4.38. Got another hour and a half. Frank? Yeah, Joe. Up ahead there in the corner? Yeah, brown sweater could be. All right, let's go. He sees us making a break through that yard there. Come on. All right, hold it up there. He isn't stopping. He's going around that garage. I'll try and hit him off. All right, watch it. <laughs> Joe, you see him? No, we missed him someplace. Better get back to the car. Right. Hey, I'll call in here. All right. Unit 1K80 to Unit 2R1. Unit 1K80 to Unit 2R1. Come in, please. Unit 2R1 to 1K80. Suspect WMA, 17 to 19 years old, wearing tan trousers and brown and gold sweater, fleeing on foot. Last seen going east on Chalmers Drive at corner of Spalding Avenue. Please block at Chalmers and Hayworth. Repeat, please block at Chalmers and Hayworth. Roger, 1K80. Unit 2R7. Come in, please. Unit 2R7 and 1K80, go ahead. You get the description all right? Yeah. Want to cover Barrows Drive and Hayes Street? Repeat, Barrows Drive and Hayes Street. Over. Roger, 1K80. Units 2R2, 2R3, 2R4, 2R5, and 2R6. 
Converge on area adjacent to Chalmers and Spaulding. Repeat. Converge on corner of Chalmers and Spaulding. Unit 2R20 will direct operations. 1K80 off. He's locked in. Let's find him. We knew the suspect was in the blockaded area. With the units from Metro Division blocking the street, there was no escape for him. Frank and I walked down Spaulding Avenue. Down the street, we could see Unit 2R20 getting into position. Sergeant Masters was directing the operations from there. The search went on. 6.40 p.m. We still hadn't found him. At each house, we notified the people to be on the lookout for the suspect. In the event they saw him, they were instructed to call police headquarters. They, in turn, would contact Sergeant Masters, and appropriate action could be taken. 7.10 p.m. We just about covered the entire area. What do you figure, Joe? Uh, yeah, I could have gotten there. He's got to be in here someplace. Two more blocks to go, not much cover. I figured that he hasn't been sitting still. He's probably been moving, too. Yeah. How about that garage back there? Mm-hmm. Check it. Big place, Joe. Looks like a workshop. Yeah. Wonder who it belongs to. Well, imagine that house over there, don't you? That's where the wires lead. Wait a minute. Yeah, look at this. Broken padlock. This must be where he is. Not easy. All right, young fella, come on out. What do you think? Oh, there's no other door. Come on. All right, come on, boy. Give it up. We know you're in here. How about the lights, Joe? Yeah, I got them. Bigger inside than it looks. Dozen places he could be hiding. Yeah, you want to check over there, back of those legs? I'll take this side. Right. No sign of over here. How about you? No. How about that balcony up there? The wooden paint can, see up there? Yeah. Somebody could hide up there. All right, I'll take a look. Take it easy, Joe. Yeah. All right, give it up, fella. You got no place to go. Watch it, Joe. The paint's missing. Let me go. Frank. Yeah, Joe, I got it. Get away. Get away. All right, watch it, Frank. I see it. Come here, you. I didn't, mean, I, I didn't mean to cut him. I told you to leave me alone. I told you. All right, come on. Get up, you. How about it, Frank? You all right? Oh, Joe, just a cut it, isn't there? Right. Let me go. I didn't mean it. I got scared. I didn't mean it. I don't know what I'll do if my family finds out. Yeah, sure. You're going to tell us about your sister, the one who was sick, and your drunken father? Huh? Well, are we going to get the full treatment here, the same one you gave Miss Blair? She told you, huh? Yeah, she told us. What's your name, boy? Aikens. Robert Aikens. You should got me tagged for the jobs, huh? Yeah, we got you tagged. Lousy deal. I thought for sure I had her figured. Crummy deal all the way around. Never should have started it. All I got was a lot of cheap jewelry and a little money. What do you mean, cheap jewelry? Our report show you got a little better than 80000 80000 that's a laugh. A lot of costume junk, a little money. 80000 Somebody's been giving you a snow job. When I didn't throw away, I still got cheap costume junk, that's all. All right, Aiken, let's go. Yeah. Should have known not to trust that Blair woman. Should have known. I was caught before, you know, a couple of times. All right. Yeah, a couple of times. They let me go. Started to cry. Getting that story about my sister. Well, let me go. It was a crime that really did it, though. As soon as I started to boil, they turned me loose. Good gimmick, huh, crime? Yeah, sure. Don't try it on the jury. It won't work. The story you have just heard was true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. Robert Charles Aiken was filed on and found guilty of 12 counts of second-degree burglary. He was released to the youth authority for parolement and possible rehabilitation.
Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Technical advisors Captain Jack Donahoe, Sergeant Monty Wynn, Sergeant Vance Brasher. Heard tonight were Herb Ellis, June Whitley, Jack Crucian. Script by John Robinson. Music.